Well, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I want to first of all thank the uh, Mount Cuba Astronomical Observatory Association for their generous support of, of this lecture series and for having the patience uh, to uh, continue to reschedule me uh, while the pandemic uh, sort of raged on. So it's really, it's great to finally be here. I think we've rescheduled this two or three times now. Uh, I want to talk to you about the search for life in our solar system. Uh, when people hear about the search for life, they tend to think about uh, listening for signals from self-aware, intelligent extraterrestrials that we are assured um, are in abundance throughout the galaxy. Um, we actually haven't heard anything, and no one really knows how abundant or not um, other uh, intelligences like us might be. One of the problems is that we know that the history of the Earth has culminated in um, the arrival of humankind literally just in the last uh, couple of hundred thousand years. If you put this on a calendar where January 1st is the beginning of the cosmos and um, the arrival of human beings is uh, the end of the year, uh, we arrive five minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve. Uh, now life itself, however, began on the Earth very soon after the Earth formed. The Earth uh, formed in, um, uh, on the cosmic time scale somewhere uh, in the, um, uh, in the, uh, the midsummer. And shortly after that, a couple weeks later on the cosmic calendar, the equivalent of a couple hundred million years of real time, life uh, appeared on the Earth. So microbial life appears to be something that fairly straightforwardly uh, was able to uh, form on the early Earth once water was present. But intelligent, sophisticated life like us, it's another story. So the question then is, is the Earth typical? Uh, has the Earth, as a habitable planet, had the kind of trajectory that other habitable planets might have elsewhere in the galaxy in terms of uh, having life once water was present. That's something that is being tackled in two ways. One, James Webb Space Telescope, as Judy mentioned, uh, will have the ability to determine whether planets around nearby stars have uh, the ingredients necessary for life. It won't be able to detect that life, but it'll tell us whether those planets are habitable. And someday, larger telescopes may be able to detect the signatures of biology around uh, uh, planets around other stars. But in the meantime, we have our own solar system. And our own solar system, surprisingly, has places in it, very distant from the sun, where liquid water oceans exist today and are stable. The question is whether those oceans might perhaps have life, microbial life, but life nonetheless. And if that turns out to be the case, and that life has had an independent origin from life on Earth, then that tells us that the uh, arising of life is a natural part of the evolution of habitable planets. So I'm going to tell you about, and I actually don't have to go over there because I have this clicker. I'm going to tell you that story, and I'm going to begin back um, in 1966. Space Age was only about eight or nine years old at that point. Uh, two years uh, prior to this quote, 1964, uh, Mariner 4 had flown by Mars and had taken the first pictures. And those pictures were absolutely shocking. They were shocking because the assumption had always been that environments like what was seen on the Earth, water, plants, and so on, would be replicated on other planets. Venus was supposed to be a tropical paradise. It turned out to be uh, an inferno with a temperature above the melting point of lead. Uh, Mars was supposed to be cold, but still maybe have water, and uh, views through telescopes showing the seasonal uh, darkening and lightening of the surface were interpreted to be uh, the presence of vegetation that was leafing out at certain times of the Martian year and then losing their leaves again. That could not be further from the truth. The picture on the right is one of the images from Mariner 4 and that showed a cratered surface that looked very much like the surface of the moon. 
So um, this was a shock, and uh, for those who were getting into uh, the question of looking for life, uh, there was a lot of explaining to do. Um, I am starting here with a quote from Carl Sagan, the Cornell astronomer, uh, who at the time, in 1966, actually was at Harvard University. And in a book that he um, co-wrote with a Russian astronomer, Yosef Shaklovsky, uh, they talked about the difficulties of finding extraterrestrial life, this coming on the heels of these somewhat disappointing images of Mars. Um, in assessing evidence for extraterrestrial life, we may be at the mercy of our prejudices. At the present time, there's no unambiguous evidence for even simple varieties of extraterrestrial life. Actually, there is no evidence, let alone unambiguous. Uh, the vegetation model for the darkening of Mars had gone away. Carl then goes on to say the situation may change in the coming years. So here we are, uh, 56 years later, and that situation actually hasn't changed. Now, if we go forward a few years to 1971, this was on the eve of the very first orbiting robotic spacecraft of Mars, Mariner 9, arriving in Martian orbit. And the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which uh, designed, built, and guided this spacecraft, uh, organized at Caltech, the neighboring campus, which actually operates JPL, a very interesting gathering, which included two science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke. And Arthur C. Clarke um, made the remarkable prediction that, uh, speaking at, at this event prior to Mariner 9 going into orbit, that the biological frontier may very well move past Mars out to Jupiter, which he said, I think is where the action is. Now, part of this may be that he was trying to sell his movie and book, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which took place in the outer solar system. The book took place at Saturn. The movie took place at Jupiter. But it turns out to be, um, for whatever the motivation may have been, a very prescient statement. Now, Mars was not out of the game. And in fact, Mariner 9 would go on to go into orbit successfully. And after some number of months where it could not image the surface because of a, a vast Martian dust storm, the surface cleared, and lo and behold, there were these channels that you see uh, on this image here from Mariner 9, these um, valley networks, which immediately were recognized to be extremely ancient because they were pockmarked by impact craters. And these impact craters indicated that, in fact, these were features that were billions of years old. So we could have two talks this evening, one on the history of the exploration of Mars, which has been a wonderful story in which it turns out we now know that Mars was Earth-like in its first billion years of its history and that it had standing liquid water on the surface, a denser atmosphere, and indeed carbon-bearing molecules, which were finally discovered after decades uh, of looking for these with, with landers and, and orbiters. But I don't want to talk about Mars because I only have uh, 50 minutes. And I want to talk about the outer solar system. Mars is a great place to go to look for evidence of past life and to understand how planets that initially can support life might evolve into lifeless, uh, not habitable worlds. But in the outer solar system, there are places to go where, in fact, there is liquid water today. So about uh, five, six, uh, seven, eight, do my math right, about eight years after Clark made this prediction, Voyager 1 flew through the Jupiter system. It did not orbit, it just flew through, and took uh, pictures that also were extremely surprising. But in the opposite direction, uh, from what the Mariner pictures, the early ones at least, had revealed about Mars. The moons of the outer solar system were assumed more or less to be too cold and too small to have any kind of interesting uh, habitable systems, uh, ecosystems effectively. Uh, they were thought to be basically balls of rock and ice. What was not realized prior to Voyager was that these moons, even though they're too far from the sun 
to uh, get enough light from the sun to melt liquid water and sustain liquid water in that way, that these had two sources of energy that could provide underground oceans. Uh, one is the natural decay of uh, radioactive elements uh, in the rocky cores of these bodies. And the other is something called tidal heating. And tidal heating was very dramatically illustrated by uh, these uh, volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, which is a body only the size of the Earth's moon. The Earth's moon more or less is geologically dead, but Io, which is the same size and density, is the most volcanically active object in the solar system. And the difference is that Io is in orbit around Jupiter, a close orbit around Jupiter. It's in an orbit that's not circular, it's eccentric. And so that eccentric orbit uh, causes Io to experience a variable gravitational force from Jupiter that essentially causes the rock inside of it to be twisted and pulled and pushed uh, so that the friction resulting from that leads to a substantial amount of heating, tidal heating. <clears throat> now, eventually that orbit will become circular as that energy is extracted from it. Um, but Io is maintained in that eccentric orbit by what's called a resonance with two of the other moons of Jupiter, uh, Europa and Ganymede. And Europa, which is also the size of the Earth's moon, turned out from Voyager images to have very few craters, to be very smooth and to be uh, crisscrossed by fractures, which suggested that maybe underneath the icy surface of Europa, Io is very rocky, Europa has an icy surface, that maybe there was a liquid water ocean. So this was a real surprise that changed people's views about where one might actually go to look for environments that could support life. And it turns out <clears throat> that there are perhaps a dozen worlds beyond Mars that potentially have oceans today. Um, Ceres in the asteroid belt certainly had an ocean in the past. Uh, there are minerals on its surface that uh, indicate they were altered by water and some of that liquid water may still be there today. Uh, the ice, the moons of Jupiter, we'll Europa. talk about uh, three moons of Saturn, uh, what two of them we'll talk about, Enceladus and Titan. Maybe the Iranian moons, although we don't know much about them, and then maybe these objects at the very edge of the solar system. But of these candidate ocean worlds, there are three that we know have liquid on or beneath their surface today. Europa uh, has a liquid water ocean under an icy crust. Enceladus has a liquid water ocean, same thing, under its icy crust. Titan, which is the moon of Saturn with um, a very dense atmosphere, has uh, not only a liquid water ocean, but also on its surface, lakes and seas of liquid methane, all of which we'll talk about this evening. Okay, so let me start with um, Europa. So <clears throat> Europa is, as I said before, the size of the Earth's moon. It orbits around Jupiter. It's actually mostly rocky. Uh, in fact, the icy part of Europa constitutes um, only about 10% of its radius. Um, but that's still a lot of ice. And it turns out, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, that much of that water is actually not in the form of ice, but is in the form of liquid. Enough liquid, in fact, that if you were to take all of it and turn it into a, a kind of a sphere, a droplet of water, and compare that to doing the same thing for the Earth as on this diagram, Europa has twice the volume of water under its icy surface than is in the Earth's oceans. So this is actually the largest ocean in the solar system. And I will explain how we know that uh, right now. So uh, again, Europa is the best place for uh, perhaps to look for conventional life. Uh, it has an ocean that's twice the volume of Earth's ocean. We know the density of Europa. We know that there's rock there even though we can't see it. Um, we know that by measuring the density of, of this object. The density is the mass divided by the volume, uh, the volume you get by looking at the physical size of this object, and the mass can be derived um, most simply by flying a spacecraft past Europa and measuring the deflection of that spacecraft's trajectory caused by the gravity of the moon. 
Europa, it turns out, has a density about three times that of water, three grams per cubic centimeter. And so it is mostly rock with an outer layer of water that is perhaps a couple of hundred kilometers in extent. Now, most of that is not ice, but is liquid water. And the first clue that that might be the case came from looking at the geology of the surface, which in detail consists of fractures and broken up blocks as if things have been moved around, have been sliding on top of a liquid layer. That circumstantial evidence is not definitive evidence. The definitive evidence comes from a kind of an unexpected measurement. And if anybody has motion sickness, you may want to close your eyes here because this uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is going to bob back and forth here for a while. Um, it comes from measuring magnetic fields in the vicinity of Europa. So Jupiter has a very, very powerful magnetic field, about 20,000 times the intensity at the cloud top of Jupiter as the Earth's magnetic field does has it at, at the surface of the Earth. So that very strong magnetic field uh, looks sort of like a dipole, kind of like what you get by uh, putting a bar magnet underneath a piece of glass and spreading iron filings on the top. They organize themselves into these loops. But that magnetic field is actually um, tilted uh, relative to the rotation axis of Jupiter. So if my forefinger here is the rotation axis of Jupiter, and Jupiter is spinning around like this. The axis of this dipole, the center of symmetry of those lines, is displaced uh, by about 20 degrees from that rotation axis. As a consequence, if you're sitting on one of the moons of Jupiter, which orbit in the uh, equatorial plane of Jupiter, as defined by the rotation axis, you would see exactly this. You would see this magnetic field oscillating up and down because it's rotating uh, in a, with a 20 degree tilt. So that oscillating magnetic field, as seen from, let's say, the surface of Europa, um, if you were to measure this with a device, something called a magnetometer, essentially you would see the field strength going up and down in this nice periodic way. Now, I'm sure everyone here has taken electromagnetism. Um, and so if you go back and remember that, um, sorry, this joke, I know a lot of people haven't taken that. But OK, <laughs> that's all right. Um, but it turns out that one of the um, interesting facts about magnetic fields is that if you put an electric conductor in a, an oscillating magnetic field like this, as that field oscillates back and forth, it generates what are called eddy currents, electric currents inside of that conductor. And those eddy currents then generate their own magnetic field, which is called an induced magnetic field. And this only happens if you have an electric conductor. If you have something that's a perfect insulator, then it doesn't feel the magnetic field at all. Nothing happens. But for an electric conductor, an iron core, a salty ocean, those all have high electrical conductivities, they will generate an additional magnetic field that can be measured by spacecraft. And that is exactly what was measured by the Galileo orbiter, which followed uh, the Voyagers. The Voyagers flew by Jupiter in 1979-1980. Galileo arrived in the mid-1990s. That very long gap is an interesting story in the history of the space program that I won't tell here. But uh, it arrived at Jupiter with a broken antenna and a broken tape recorder, uh, but nonetheless was able to make these magnetic field measurements. And it very, very clearly saw this induced magnetic field in the vicinity of Europa. And in fact, multiple flybys of Europa revealed this extra magnetic field that was generated by the oscillations of Jupiter's magnetic field as seen by Europa. The nature and strength of that induced magnetic field um, could not be explained if Europa had an iron core, which is where the Earth's magnetic field is generated, in our iron core. It had to be closer to the surface. And the only thing that could be close to the surface that would have um, a strong electric conductivity is salty water. 
So that is the evidence that Europa has a saltwater ocean underneath its ice crust. And this is the first ocean, subterranean ocean, in our solar system to be detected. Now, you might think that that's also circumstantial evidence, but it's actually very, very strong circumstantial evidence. And that taken together with the geology of Europa uh, says, yes, there is indeed um, an ocean under the surface. Now, the geology that's seen in some of these images, like this one that you see here, um, can be used to estimate how thick the ice crust is. And the ice crust in most parts of Europa is probably no more than 10 uh, or 20 kilometers thick. A kilometer is about two-thirds of a mile. So when you combine that with the evidence for the ocean and the fact that uh, the size of the rocky core is determined by the density of Europa, you put all that together, uh, the conclusion is that this ocean has a thickness of something approaching 200 kilometers, between 150 and 200 kilometers. And that is, that leads you to the conclusion that this ocean has twice the volume of liquid water uh, compared to all of the liquid water on the Earth. So even though it's a smaller object, it's the size of the moon, not the size of the Earth, there is more liquid water on Europa underneath this ice crust than is in the Earth's oceans. And that's about all we know about this uh, remarkable moon. We don't know whether the ocean has organic molecules in it, carbon-bearing molecules. We even don't know very much about um, the, salty, the saltiness, the extent of the saltiness of the interior. Um, what we do know comes uh, from other kinds of observations. The Hubble Space Telescope, for example, <coughs> was used by a group at Caltech, Trumbo et al., to map uh, the um, uh, presence of sodium chloride on the surface of Europa. Sodium chloride is colorless as table salt, but when it's irradiated, it actually uh, begins to acquire a color. And that color corresponds to um, absorptions at certain wavelengths of the spectrum that can be seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, Jupiter's magnetic field, in addition to providing this clue that Europa has an ocean, also carries with it charged particles that bombard the surface of Europa, make it very uh, uninhabitable for life at the surface, including human life, as well as microbes. Um, but that irradiation uh, acts on things like the sodium chloride to color it and make it detectable uh, as, um, <clears throat> as a spectral um, uh, uh, candidate for these spectral features. So this was work done uh, by Samantha Trumbo when she was a graduate student at Caltech. Now she's at Cornell as a postdoc. And what's uh, particularly interesting or telling is that the concentration of sodium chloride, which is given by the dark blue features on this map, corresponds to the places on Europa that seem to have the most fractures and the thinnest crust. And so that indicates that these are areas which are closest to the ocean underneath. And so that sodium chloride very, very likely is coming out of the interior from the ocean. The water is evaporating and it's leaving the salt as a deposit on the surface. So that's the best evidence that we have that the ocean is actually in communication uh, with the surface and is leaving deposits of material on the surface from which we can learn some things about the nature of the ocean. Are there organic molecules present, for example? So the next step is uh, a mission called Europa Clipper, which will launch in 2024. It's a robotic mission that will orbit Jupiter and make close flybys of Europa and map the surface with a number of instruments. Those instruments I'm not going to go through here, but they range from cameras and spectrometers that will map the presence of salts and, if they're there, organic molecules on the surface, um, a long wavelength infrared uh, imager to detect hot spots where warm water may be welling up, a radar system called Reason that will uh, determine the actual thickness of the crust itself, and these devices called mass spectrometers that will actually collect material that might be lofted from the surface and 
plumes or just by evaporation um, and provide a direct measure of the composition. Now, this won't launch till two years from now and get to Europa in 2030, but we had a little foretaste of what could be done uh, when the Juno spacecraft, which is currently in a polar orbit around Jupiter, made a very close flyby of Europa, its only close flyby, back in late September. It passed within 350 kilometers. And there are two camera systems on Juno. One is called Juno Cam. The uh, lead for that is Candy Hansen at um, Planetary Science Institute. And then there's another camera system called the Stellar Reference Unit, which is led by Heidi Becker. So these are beautiful images, but I want to focus on the one on the right from the Stellar Reference Unit. The Stellar Reference Unit is a low light camera that was put on Juno to image the background of stars to determine the orientation of Juno relative to the limb of Jupiter. It's a navigation system. But it also takes great images, has very high resolution. And this is an image of Europa taken in Jupiter shine. This is a part of Europa that at the time of the flyby was on the night side, the sun was on the other side, but it was being illuminated by the reflected light of Jupiter. And this is the highest resolution image we have from this flyby. You see these dark features up here along this crack. This looks like material that may have oozed out from the crack and been radiation darkened. And the same with this material here. In fact, features like this seen in Galileo images have been interpreted to be areas where salty water um, was present just under the crust and caused the, the crust above it to collapse. So with the spectrometers on Europa Clipper going to places like this, uh, the hope is to be able to find organic molecules, determine whether this ocean is potentially habitable. To look for life would be another step beyond that. You'd have to land in some of these places and try to actually analyze the organic molecules to see if they come from biology. So that's the story with Europa. Um, I want to move on to the Saturn system. There are two moons I want to talk about here. One is Saturn's moon Enceladus. It is really small. This is the size of Enceladus compared to the Earth's moon. It's 500 kilometers or 300 miles across. So why is it at all of interest? I mean, a tiny moon is likely to cool off very quickly and not have liquid water. Well, it turns out that Enceladus has liquid water. It's tidally heated, although what that tidal heating actually derives from is not entirely well understood. Um, it turns out not to be in a resonance with the other moons of Saturn. Um, so this is something of a mystery. But what's particularly spectacular about Enceladus is that it is uh, expressing or blowing material out of its south polar region directly into space. So the south polar region is crisscrossed by these fractures about 100 kilometers or 60 miles long. When you look at Enceladus uh, backlit from a spacecraft, this is from the Cassini spacecraft, which arrived in uh, 2004 and quickly discovered this plume uh, from Saturn orbit. You see this material uh, pouring out of Enceladus and actually creating a ring of material, the center of which is Enceladus itself. This ring called the E-ring was actually discovered from the Earth at the Allegheny Observatory in the 1960s, but it was not understood what the source of that material was. It turns out it's coming from inside Enceladus. And when you look at higher resolution, you see the plume breaks up into individual jets, and they're coming from these uh, intricate fractures in the south polar region um, that um, go down to um, something like 100 meters in, uh, in width. So, so this is a heavily fractured surface, presumably caused by tides, uh, with material pouring out. Well, what is that material? That material is uh, mostly water. And that is known principally because the Cassini spacecraft, um, which um, made those images, carried with it two mass spectrometers, one called the INMS and the other called the CDA, Cosmic Dust Analyzer. Mass spectrometers are chemical devices that ionize atoms and molecules and analyze the weight, the mass, of those molecules to determine their identity. Once the plume was discovered, Cassini could be flown through the plume. It was determined to be safe. 
and in 12 of these traverses directly measure this material. Now, the plume itself is very interesting, but how do we know that that plume is coming from an ocean? So the first question is, what is the evidence for an ocean under the surface? Because when the plume was first discovered by Cassini in 2004, 2005, some scientists proposed that it was simply material coming out of an icy crust. So first point number one, the density of Enceladus is about 1.8 times the density of water. So there's a substantial amount of rock there, just as there is for Europa, not quite as much but quite a lot. So that's a source of additional heating. Point number two, the outer part of Enceladus is water. We can see that uh, by observing the surface. So the rock is underneath and the ice is on top. But it turns out that this ice crust is not just static, but it's actually sliding back and forth um, over something that's between the rock and the ice itself. Cassini observed Enceladus for a number of years and was able to track what's called the libration of the satellite, which is the nodding back and forth of this moon as it orbits Saturn. It's in, again, an eccentric orbit around Saturn, not a circular orbit, and as a consequence of that, Saturn tugs and pulls on it and causes the moon to rock back and forth. Our own moon, for example, has a libration amplitude of seven degrees. If you photograph it over the period of a month, you can actually see it sliding back and forth. Um, it turns out that the amount of libration of Enceladus is three times what you would expect if Enceladus is a rigid, solid body being pulled and tugged in its entirety by Saturn. So this larger amplitude rocking motion can only be explained if that ice crust is not attached to the rock core underneath, but in fact is sliding back and forth over it with some intervening material which is frictionless. That would have to be liquid water. So that's one line of evidence for liquid water. Another line of evidence is that um, Cassini, with its mass spectrometers, measured uh, these large ice grains that were, um, in fact, quite salty. And um, the amount of salt corresponds to about 2%, as much as 2%. The salt in the Earth's oceans is about 4%. So this is about half the saltiness of the Earth's oceans. But that's still quite a lot. And in fact, that amount of salt does not dissolve in ice. It only dissolves in liquid water. And so what that is saying is that these large ice grains, before they came out of Enceladus, were liquid water with the salt dissolved in it. As, though, as that liquid water came out through these fractures, it froze and the ice was trapped inside. So that is evidence that these large ice grains coming from the interior were liquid water. So liquid water here, um, the rocking motion or libration indicates that that liquid water layer is continuous. There are other lines of evidence as well. The fractures are quite a bit hotter than the background surface. Um, there's also evidence from gravity measurements, which I won't get into. Um, it's kind of an involved argument. But all of this put together says that what the interior of Enceladus looks like is this. There is an ice crust about 30 kilometers thick. There is intervening liquid water under that, thinner away from the South Pole, thicker toward the South Pole where these uh, jets are coming out, the plume. And then underneath that is the rock. So what is happening at the interface between the rock and the liquid water? In the case of Europa, we don't know until we actually send instruments that can measure the stuff coming out onto the surface. In the case of Enceladus with Cassini, which had mass spectrometers, we do know what's happening. So one of the uh, bits and pieces coming out in this plume, in these jets of material, is not just water ice, salty water, but also tiny grains of silica, SiO2, which should be familiar to you as sand, sand on a beach. 
That SiO2 is in the form of very, very tiny grains, nanometer size grains, which are uniform in, um, in, uh, in size. And the question is, how do you get that coming out of an ocean? So this is the data from the mass spectrometer uh, showing the identification of a silicon peak and an oxygen peak. And now we're going to do a little chemistry. So one way to get pure silica, SiO2, is to take a very common kind of rock called phaolite, which is seen on the ocean floor of the Earth, react it with hot water, and it forms magnetite, another common mineral, silica, and hydrogen. So you would see coming out in this plume the water from the ocean. The silica is seen, so is the hydrogen there. So that's a difficult measurement to make for various reasons, but after the silica was discovered, in, in the last fly-through of the plume, um, one of the mass spectrometers uh, was tuned to uh, look for hydrogen, and indeed it found molecular hydrogen in abundance above Enceladus, uh, co-located with these fractures. And so this is very, very strong evidence that there is what's called a hydrothermal system, reaction of water with rock at the bottom of Enceladus's ocean. That happens at the base of the Earth's ocean. And where that happens, there's plenty of chemical energy for life. But are there organics? The answer is yes, there are organic molecules also in the ocean of Enceladus. So there's water, there's salt, there's energy in the hydrothermal system, there are carbon-bearing molecules. So one of the mass spectrometers measured um, carbon-bearing molecules that you would expect um, in the gas coming out of the plume, that's carbon dioxide and methane. The other mass spectrometer measured what are called refractory organics, things that would not be in the gas but would be trapped in the ice grains. And this is what's called a mass spectrum, and the molecular weight of these species are identified here. And what you see um, at this longer, uh, higher mass tail is a set of masses that if you subtract one from the one previously in these peaks, you get 12, in a couple of places, 13. So those of you who've taken chemistry, what element has the molecular weight of, or atomic weight of 12? Carbon. Carbon, okay. 13 is carbon and hydrogen. These molecules, these ice grains, are slamming into the spacecraft as it flies through the plume of Enceladus. So what's going to break off of those organic molecules is principally carbon and hydrogen, either in the form of C or the form of CH. And so um, these uh, peaks here reflect that, and they're very, very strong evidence, again, for organics, but high molecular weight organics. Now, what the identification of these are, are they amino acids or something else? We can't tell with this kind of instrument because it's a relatively crude mass spectrometer, but they are organic molecules nonetheless. Okay, so is there life in this ocean? There's energy, there's water, there's salts, there are nutrients, there are chemical reactions going on. Is there life? Well, the instruments on Cassini can't tell us that. But we can play a little game, which is to determine how far away from equilibrium the chemistry in this ocean actually is. And the way to do that is to make an assumption that the carbon dioxide and the methane that are seen are part of a metabolism, a metabolism that is referred to as methanogenesis, or formation of methane. And that happens in very primitive microbes uh, on the Earth. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen are combined to make methane and water in cells. Now, a chemist will tell you that for a given temperature and salinity and acidity in the ocean, uh, she can calculate for you what the abundances of each of these species should be if the system is in what's called chemical equilibrium, which would pretty much be a dead system. It would be a system in which nothing actively is going on. So what this graph attempts to show is a summary calculation comparing the um, expected value of these abundances in equilibrium with what is actually found in the ocean of Enceladus. 
And this is a very technical graph, I, I understand that, but you can appreciate that what's drawn here at zero is the equilibrium case. That would be a lifeless ocean. Um, anything above that would indicate that there is something keeping the abundances of these species away from equilibrium in such a way that there's energy available uh, for life. And it turns out that for Enceladus, um, the abundances of these species and the uh, acidity of the ocean that's determined from measuring other things in the plume corresponds to this blue region, which is well above equilibrium. For Earth microbes that are undergoing methanogenesis, the range is typically in here shown by this double arrow, and this overlaps with what's found for the ocean of Enceladus. So this is very, very, very circumstantial evidence that there could be microbes actually converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen into methane in the ocean. Another possibility is that geochemistry is doing this and there aren't any organisms at all. All we can say from this calculation is that this ocean is not dead. Either geochemistry or biochemistry is acting on it. So how do we determine that? Well, resources are limited at NASA, and um, the fastest way to get back to Enceladus after the end of the Cassini mission, which ended in 2017, is simply to go back with um, a spacecraft to orbit Saturn, but to carry mass spectrometers that are much, much higher resolution, much more sensitive, and better able to determine the identities of these molecules. Those mass spectrometers didn't exist at the time that Cassini was flown, but they exist today. One of them is going to Europa. And so a group of us have proposed to NASA a mission that we call Enceladus Life Finder. It would be a simple spacecraft that would be solar powered, not complicated like Cassini, because we want to try to get this going under one of NASA's um, medium class mission categories called New Frontiers. And it would carry with it two mass spectrometers that would be able to determine at a very, very fine scale the mass numbers of whatever organics are coming out in the plume as the spacecraft flies through. And by doing that, we can do things like identify amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins that are the basis of life. Those are the enzymes and the cellular structures that all life on Earth is made of. And it's known to biologists that the distribution of different amino acids, shown here in the upper left, is very different for biology than it is for non-biological systems. If you go into a chemical lab and make amino acids, the most abundant amino acid that is made in uh, a chemical reactor is the one that has the lowest energy, is the simplest to make, which is glycine. All the others are very, very underabundant. But in biological systems, glycine is not all that useful, and so other amino acids have higher abundances. So we would look for a non-abiotic, um, a non-chemical uh, distribution of amino acids. Um, there are other tests we would do. I'm not going to go through this one. This is what we call the ELF discovery space. The Cassini Cosmic Dust Analyzer, which produced that beautiful set of patterns of organic molecules, that ended here at a mass of 200. Um, lots of organic molecules that are produced by life and not so commonly in nature, things like stearanes and hopanes and uh, chains of amino acids called peptides, they're all out here at these larger mass units. So one would send a mass spectrometer that can get out into this much larger um, molecular mass range and look for very large molecules that are highly unlikely to be made by biology. That is the simplest way to look for life because Enceladus is providing free samples. It's gas and ice and dust pouring out into space from the South Polar Ocean and all you have to do is bring the right instruments to analyze the molecules in that gas. Now, if you want to go one step further, land on Enceladus. That's a challenging thing, but 
actually not as difficult as for Europa. The gravity is lower. There's much less radiation. Saturn has a very weak magnetic field compared to Jupiter. So um, a group of us, led by Shannon McKenzie at Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University, put together a study for NASA as to what it would take to land a spacecraft on the surface of Enceladus. And this study actually was so well received that in the most recent strategic plan for the next decade of planetary exploration, this was ranked number two among the missions. Now that doesn't mean that it would get to Enceladus in the next decade. That means that this would get started as a project in the next decade. It would then take seven years to build, it would then take 10 years to get to Enceladus, so do the math, that's 27 years. And that's the time scale for looking for life in the outer solar system. I wanna close with Saturn's moon Titan, and um, this is a large moon. It is, in fact, larger than the Earth's moon. It's another moon of Saturn. Uh, Titan has the only dense atmosphere in the solar system of all the moons. It's the only moon with a dense atmosphere. The air is mostly molecular nitrogen. It has a density four times the density of air in this room. But Titan being very far from the sun and not being tidally heated is very cold. The surface temperature is 95 degrees above absolute zero. Um, that's uh, something on the order of minus 370 Fahrenheit. Um, 390 Fahrenheit minus. So liquid water is frozen out on the surface. Now we know from very sensitive measurements that Cassini made of the slight tugging and pulling that Titan experiences in its orbit around Saturn that there is a deep liquid water ocean. But more interesting is that on the surface of Titan are lakes and seas of liquid methane. The surface temperature of Titan is just, just about right for liquid methane to take the place of water. And Cassini not only observed these lakes and seas, this is a map of them done uh, from the radar system on Cassini because Titan's atmosphere is very hazy, so you need a radar system to, to penetrate that haze. Um, not only do we know that, but we also know something about the composition of these lakes and seas. And by the way, Kraken Mare is in absolute size, about the size of the Caspian Sea. Ligeia Mare is about the size of Lake Superior. Uh, and these are um, on an object that is smaller than the Earth, smaller than Mars. It's a big moon, but it's still only about the size of the planet Mercury. So these are big bodies of liquid. So how do we know that they're liquid methane? Well, first of all, that's the liquid that's stable under these conditions on Titan. Secondly, Cassini brought with it a probe that was dropped into Titan's atmosphere and in descending to the surface, measured methane in the atmosphere. But there's also a very clever experiment done with the radar system uh, on Cassini which made those images. So the radar system is, normally makes images by canting the antenna to the side because then you can determine the range of different pulses that are emitted and the Doppler shift. But if you point the antenna directly down at the surface of Titan, you can measure what's called the bathymetry or the depth of these seas. And the reason that you can do this is that they are somewhat transparent to radio waves. The land, which is we think is ice on Titan, it's an ice rock object, only produces a single bounce of radar. So this is a radar gram showing a single bounce here. But in these dark areas, which were presumed to be liquid methane, there were actually two bounces detected. One from the surface, that's the strong bounce here, and one bounce from the bottom. Has anyone ever gone bass fishing with a bass sonar? All right, never mind. Um, well, it's sort of like that. You send pulses of sound down and you try to detect fish intervening between you and the bottom, but you also detect the bottom. So these radar grams here um, are given in terms of time delay and they correspond, of course, radar moves at the speed of light, radio waves move at the speed of light. Um, the difference between the time that the top signal and the bottom was received 
corresponds to a depth of 300 meters. And the transparency of these seas uh, can be measured by looking at the weakness of the signal, the drop in intensity of the signal from the bottom of the sea relative to the top of the sea. And that drop in intensity corresponds to these seas being made of liquid methane and ethane. The microwave absorptivity, the amount of absorption that these liquids do in, in microwaves and radio waves is measured in the laboratory. And this corresponds beautifully to the drop in intensity for a depth of a couple of hundred meters. This technique was actually developed first in Rome by a professor, Giovanni Picardi, who's now passed away. These are two of his students, uh, Marco and Valerio, who have both been postdocs at Cornell, first Marco and then Valerio, working on this, um, on this uh, project. And we're going to get Valerio a suit just like Marco, because that's a really, really nice one. Um, but um, it's a remarkable result, because by flying by Titan, you can determine that there are methane lakes and seas that go down a couple of hundred meters. So could there be a form of life in, the methane, in a methane sea? This is a totally different kind of liquid environment than liquid water. Methane is not like liquid water. Liquid water does what's called hydrogen bonding, where the hydrogen on one end of the water attracts the oxygen on a neighboring water molecule and creates a structure in the liquid. Methane doesn't do that at all. Also, these liquids are really, really cold on Titan, 95 Kelvin. And those temperatures correspond to um, a rate of chemical reactions. And that's what these two graphs are showing. So this is um, the energy uh, required for a reaction versus time. In order for a reaction to be completed in, um, let's say, minutes here, on the Earth, um, this uh, corresponds to a certain energy. On Titan, in order for that same reaction to go, the energy involved in the bonds would have to be two or three times weaker than on the Earth. The bonds in life, in living systems, are called covalent bonds. And they tend to be, have a strength that, on this scale over here, is something like a couple of hundred kilojoules per mole. That's the amount of energy per certain number of particles. In order to get the same kind of facility of chemical reactions on Titan, we'd have to go down by a factor of uh, 10 to 100. So could that be possible? Well, there's another kind of chemistry involving hydrogen bonding, which is much weaker than covalent bonding. And in terrestrial systems, doesn't happen because liquid water hydrogen bonds. And so it tends to what's called saturate all those hydrogen bonds. So life doesn't really do that kind of hydrogen bonding. But life in a chemical sea, in the methane sea on Titan, maybe it's possible that it does that. So a very talented uh, young chemist, Martin Rahm, put together some possibilities for um, bonding equivalent to what happens in DNA on the Earth. These are two nucleic acid bases bonding with each other, um, GC, guanine, and cytosine, and two others. They have bond strengths that are shown up here of about 100 in these units. On Titan, the equivalent might happen in polymers of uh, organic molecules and hydrogen cyanide. And in fact, Titan's atmosphere is full of these organic molecules. The methane and the nitrogen that are the dominant components of Titan's atmosphere, as they waft up into the upper atmosphere, are converted by ultraviolet rays of the sun into complex molecules, like hydrogen cyanide, like acetylene, like other polymers. And so dropped into the sea of Titan, maybe those combine to make these kinds of molecules or even sheets uh, and polymers that could serve as catalytic sites equivalent to proteins. All of this is very wild imaginative chemistry. Martin is brilliant. He's now a professor at, um, uh, in Sweden. He was postdoc at Cornell. But we don't know if any of this happens. And to know if it happens, we have to go back to Titan. And there is a mission that NASA is developing. The principal investigator is Elizabeth Turtle at Johns Hopkins. And this is a quadcopter 
that will be parachuted down to the surface of Titan and then with these rotors will fly around Titan and measure the organic deposits that are there. So we may get an answer from this mission which will be the, the very first uh, quadcopter um, on another planet. Uh, the Ingenuity helicopter, of course, on Mars being the other. So I'm going to close. I'm not going to talk about these programs, but I'm going to summarize with some of these places to go. And I appreciate your patience in allowing me to go into detail, but I wanted to give you some sense of what we really know and don't know about these places. I mentioned the asteroid series. Does it have remnants of an ocean? We don't know that. There's not been a mission to land on Ceres, only to orbit it. Um, so that's a place that we need to go to see if there's still an ocean. Um, is Europa's ocean habitable? That will be determined by Europa Clipper. Um, I didn't talk about the Iranian moons, but there may be oceans under their surface. Any mission to go there is a very, very long time in the future, maybe the 2040s or 2050s. But Enceladus, we know, has an ocean, the moon of Saturn. It has the basic ingredients for life and the basic necessities of habitability, energy, organic, salt, and liquid water. So the next step is to go and look for life. And Titan is a place to seek the outer limits of biology. Now, I'm going to close um, by another quote by Carl Sagan. This is 30 years after his other book. This is the last book he wrote, in which he cautions us to be careful in looking for life. Um, there was a meteorite that had been recovered on the Earth that clearly was from Mars. Uh, we know that because of the trapped gases that were present in it. But when it was analyzed in detail, it was thought to contain traces of life. There were uh, electron micrograph images of very tiny worm-like things. There was evidence of organic molecules. And in the mid-1990s, um, all of this went on, and there was a lot of excitement that maybe this meteorite had life in it. None of that turned out to be the case. As scientists, we had fooled ourselves. So Carl Sagan, um, in that same year uh, when he died, said that um, we have to keep our minds open when exploring new worlds. We don't know what we're going to find. The moons of the outer solar system were never thought to have oceans. They turn out to have them. And so many surprises are possible. But we also, as humans, have a talent for deceiving ourselves. If we want to look for life in the solar system, we will find life but it may actually not really be there. We have to be very careful to be skeptical and design our life detection experiments in a way that makes sure that we're not detecting false positives. As he put it, skepticism must be a component of the explorer's toolkit or we will lose our way. There are wonders enough out there without our inventing any. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I just wonder, do you have an estimate for the temperature in the uh, in the oceans of uh, Europa and Enceladus? Because you mentioned yeah, the, right. the dependence of the chemical reaction rates on right. temperature. So for Europa, we do not. Um, for Enceladus, actually, we do. And it comes from the fact that these tiny silica grains are tiny because they were dissolved in the liquid water at some point. Um, to have extracted them and be dissolved um, at the, the abundances that are seen suggests that at the interface between the base of the ocean and the rock, the temperature is as high as 50 degrees Celsius, which is quite high. But that's where the water is cycling through what is apparently hot rock, and the rock may be hot because of tidal heating, the squeezing and pulling. At the top of that ocean, there's ice, right? Because the, there's ice intervening between um, the ocean and space. So at that point, the ocean is at the freezing point of water. So it's varying at the top between zero Celsius and at the bottom, at least in places, 50 Celsius. It's quite warm. Thank you for the talk. Sure. I was wondering if you could talk more about the distribution of radioactive materials throughout the solar system, and if in those bodies in the outer solar system there's enough radioactivity 
in the cores to keep those cores hot enough to create smokers sure. and to create this source of heat. Okay, great question. Um, so the information that's available on the radioactive elements uh, beyond the earth comes from meteorites, from what are called the chondrites. And they have uh, an abundance of uranium and thorium and potassium that uh, include radioactive isotopes that decay slowly over billions of years. It's assumed that rock elsewhere in the solar system is gonna be similar to those meteorites, but we don't know for sure. If you assume that it is the same abundance uh, and you take the age of the solar system, then you find the following. For Enceladus, it's too small and the surface area to volume ratio is too large for a tiny body, or let's turn it around. The volume to surface area ratio is too small to maintain that ocean just by radioactive decay alone. So it has to be tidal heating. Now, one of the things that will ex um, amplify tidal heating is if the material is broken apart so that it's easy to sort of rub together and create tidal friction. There is evidence that Enceladus's core, the rocky core, is relatively low density. That is, it's suffused with water. It's what's called hydrated minerals. That would aid in tidal heating, and that's probably where the, 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 the elevated temperatures are coming from. The, the problem with this story is that in order to maintain tidal heating, you have to keep the orbit of Enceladus eccentric. It can't be a circle. And to keep it eccentric, it has to be in what's called a resonance with another moon where the orbit periods are simple integer multiples of each other so that they tug and pull on each other the way you would push a child's swing rhythmically. There is no other moon that Enceladus is in resonance with today, but there is a moon that it's close to resonance with, and that's Dione. So if it was in resonance in the recent past, and the orbits evolved to bring it out of resonance, it could still have that tidal heat, but you know, it, it would eventually get cold and the ocean might eventually freeze. So the story for Enceladus is a little complicated for that reason. For Europa, once you have formed the ocean, Europa is big enough that the rocky core, which is the size of the Earth's moon, it's big, is enough by radioactive decay to maintain that ocean. Nonetheless, there is some tidal heating. Um, we know that from looking at Io, and that helps to accentuate and presumably increase the temperatures at the base. So, um, so those are the two objects that we know something about there. Titan is enormous. Titan is the, it's, it's the size of the planet Mercury. Um, but it's only about half rock and half ice. So the rocky part is no bigger than Europa. And then it's got this big ice mantle on top of it. So um, there again, radiogenic heating might be enough to maintain the ocean. It's over there. Thank you so much for the talk. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask, do we have any estimates for how long these oceans have existed? Is, do they date to around the same age that the Earth was formed, or? That is a really important question, because clearly, if you're looking for life, you want to have an ocean that's long lives, so there's enough time for life to begin, although no one knows how long it took for life to begin on Earth. We have an upper limit, which is a few hundred million years when they appear in, begin to appear in the fossil record. So Europa could have had its ocean for the entire age of the solar system. We don't know that that's the case, but the tidal heating and the fact that it's trapped in a resonance with Ganymede on one side and Io on the other means that it could have been in the state for arbitrarily long periods of time. So the ocean could actually be quite ancient. And there are ways to, d to tell something about that by looking at the isotopes of certain noble gases like argon, argon-40, which is produced from potassium-40 in the rock itself. And you know how much of that has been produced over time might tell us something about that. Um, but 
only Europa, we have to wait for Europa Clipper to bring a mass spectrometer. Enceladus, that's really the problem, as I was just describing. Um, it's not clear how long it stays in a resonance with Dione, if it goes in and out of that resonance, or if this is a recent event. The ocean might be only, you know, a couple hundred million years old. If you turned off all the energy and you asked how long it would take for the ocean to freeze, because of the latent heat of water, it doesn't freeze immediately, it would take about 100 million years. So the ocean is at least that old, but that's not very old. So love to know the answer to that. I have a graduate student, Nyok Trong, who's going to graduate soon and is looking for a postdoc job. Um, just advertising. Uh, and he's modeling um, what noble gas signatures you expect to find as a function of the age of the ocean, because noble gases will exsolve at a certain rate, and that could be tested by the next mission. So answer is we don't know. <laughs>